Introduction Life in the Clearings versus the Bush by Susanna Moody This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dedication I sketch from nature, and the draft is true. Whate'er the picture, whether grave or gay, Painful experience in a distant land Made it mine own. To John Wedderburn Dunbar Moody, Esquire, Sheriff of the County of Hastings, Upper Canada, This work is affectionately dedicated By his attached friend and wife, Susanna Moody. Introduction Dear Foster Mother, On whose ample breast The hungry still find food, The weary rest, the child of want that treads thy happy shore Shall feel the grasp of poverty no more. His honest toil meet recompense can claim, And freedom bless him with a freeman's name. In our work of Roughing It in the Bush, I endeavoured to draw a picture of Canadian life as I found it twenty years ago in the backwoods. My motive in giving such a melancholy narrative to the British public was prompted by the hope of deterring well-educated people about to settle in this colony from entering upon a life for which they were totally unfitted by their previous pursuits and habits. To persons unaccustomed to hard labour, and used to the comforts and luxuries deemed indispensable to those moving in the middle classes at home, a settlement in the bush can offer few advantages. It has proved the ruin of hundreds and thousands who have ventured their all in this hazardous experiment, nor can I recollect a single family of the higher class that have come under my own personal knowledge that ever realized an independence, or bettered their condition, by taking up wild lands in remote localities, while volumes may be filled with failures even more disastrous than our own, to prove the truth of my former statements. But while I have endeavoured to point out the error of gentlemen bringing delicate women and helpless children to toil in the woods, and by so doing excluding them from all social intercourse with persons in their own rank, and depriving the younger branches of the family of the advantages of education, which, in the vicinity of towns and villages, can be enjoyed by the children of the poorest emigrant, I never have said anything against the real benefits to be derived from a judicious choice of settlement in this great and rising country. God forbid that any representations of mine should deter one of my countrymen from making this noble and prosperous colony his future home. But let him leave to the hardy labourer the place assigned to him by Providence, nor undertake, upon limited means, the task of pioneer in the great wilderness." Men of independent fortune can live anywhere. If such prefer a life in the woods, to the woods let them go. But they will soon find out that they could have employed the means in their power in a far more profitable manner than in chopping down trees in the bush. There are a thousand more advantageous ways in which a man of property may invest his capital than by burying himself and his family in the woods. There never was a period in the history of the colony that offered greater inducements to men of moderate means to emigrate to Canada than the present. The many plank roads and railways in the course of construction in the province, while they afford high and remunerative wages to the working classes, will amply repay the speculator who embarks a portion of his means in purchasing shares in them. And if he is bent upon becoming a Canadian farmer, Numbers of fine farms in healthy and eligible situations, and in the vicinity of good markets, are to be had on moderate terms, that would amply repay the cultivator for the money and labour expended upon them. There are thousands of independent proprietors of this class in Canada, men who move in the best society, and whose names have a political weight in the country. Why gentlemen from Britain should obstinately crowd to the backwoods, and prefer the coarse, hard life of an axeman to that of a respectable landed proprietor in a civilized part of the country, has always been to me a matter of surprise. For a farm, under cultivation, can always be purchased for far less money 
than must necessarily be expended upon clearing and raising buildings upon a wild lot. Many young men are attracted to the backwoods by the facilities they present for hunting and fishing. The wild, free life of the hunter has for an ardent and romantic temperament an inexpressible charm. But hunting and fishing, however fascinating as a wholesome relaxation from labor, will not win bread, or clothe a wife and shivering little ones, and those who give themselves entirely up to such pursuits soon add to these profitless accomplishments the bush vices of smoking and drinking, and quickly throw off those moral restraints upon which their respectability and future welfare mainly depend. The bush is the most demoralizing place to which an anxious and prudent parent could send a young lad. Freed suddenly from all parental control, and exposed to the contaminating influence of broken-down gentlemen loafers who hide their pride and poverty in the woods, he joins in their low debauchery, and falsely imagines that, by becoming a blackguard, he will be considered an excellent backwoodsman. How many fine young men have I seen beggared and ruined in the bush? It is too much the custom in the woods for the idle settler who will not work to live upon the newcomer as long as he can give him good fare and his horn of whiskey. When these fail, farewell to your good-hearted, roistering friends. They will leave you like a swarm of mosquitoes while you fret over your festering wounds and fly to suck the blood of some new settler who is fool enough to believe their offers of friendship. The dreadful vice of drunkenness, of which I shall have occasion to speak hereafter, is nowhere displayed in more revolting colors, or occurs more frequently than in the bush. Nor is it exhibited by the lower classes in so shameless a manner as by the gentlemen settlers, from whom a better example might be expected. It would not be difficult to point out the causes which too often lead to these melancholy results. Loss of property incapacity for hard labor, yielding the mind to low and degraded vices, which destroy self-respect and paralyze honest exertion, and the annihilation of those extravagant hopes that false statements made by interested parties had led them to entertain of fortunes that might be realized in the woods. These are a few among the many reasons that could be given for the number of victims that yearly fill a drunkard's dishonorable grave. At the period when the greatest portion of Roughing It in the Bush was written, I was totally ignorant of life in Canada, as it existed in the towns and villages. Thirteen years' residence in one of the most thriving districts of the upper province has given me many opportunities of becoming better acquainted with the manners and habits of her busy, bustling population than it was possible for me ever to obtain in the green prison of the woods. Since my residence in a settled part of the country, I have enjoyed as much domestic peace and happiness as ever falls to the lot of poor humanity. Canada has become almost as dear to me as my native land, and the homesickness that constantly preyed upon me in the backwoods has long ago yielded to the deepest and most heartfelt interest in the rapidly increasing prosperity and greatness of the country of my adoption, the great foster-mother of that portion of the human family whose fatherland, however dear to them, is unable to supply them with bread. To the honest sons of labor, Canada is, indeed, an El Dorado, a land flowing with milk and honey, for they soon obtain that independence which the poor gentleman struggles in vain to realize by his own labor in the woods. The conventional prejudices that shackle the movement of members of the higher classes in Britain are scarcely recognized in Canada and a man is at liberty to choose the most profitable manner of acquiring wealth without the fear of ridicule and the loss of caste. The friendly relations which now exist between us and our enterprising, intelligent American neighbors have doubtless done much to produce this amalgamation of classes. The gentleman no longer looks down with supercilious self-importance on the wealthy merchant, nor does the latter refuse to the ingenious mechanic the respect due to him as a man. A more healthy state pervades Canadian society than existed here a few years ago, when party feeling ran high, and the professional men and office-holders visited exclusively among themselves, 
affecting airs of aristocratic superiority, which were perfectly absurd in a new country, and which gave great offence to those of equal wealth who were not admitted to their clique. Though too much of this spirit exists in the large cities such as Quebec, Montreal, and Toronto, it would not be tolerated in the small district towns and villages, where a gentleman could not take a surer method of making himself unpopular than by exhibiting this feeling to his fellow townsmen. I have been repeatedly asked, since the publication of Roughing It in the Bush, to give an account of the present state of society in the colony, and to point out its increasing prosperity and commercial advantages. But statistics are not my forte, nor do I feel myself qualified for such an arduous and important task. My knowledge of the colony is too limited to enable me to write a comprehensive work on a subject of vital consequence, which might involve the happiness of others. But what I do know I will endeavour to sketch with a light pencil, and if I cannot convey much useful information, I will try to amuse the reader, and by a mixture of prose and poetry compile a small volume which may help to while away an idle hour, or fill up the blanks of a wet day. Belleville, Canada West, November 24, 1852 Indian Summer By the purple haze that lies On the distant rocky height By the deep blue of the skies By the smoky amber light Through the forest arches streaming Where nature on her throne sits dreaming And the sun is scarcely gleaming Through the cloudlets snowy white Winter's lovely herald greets us, Ere the ice-crowned tyrant meets us. A mellow softness fills the air, No breeze on wanton wing steals by, To break the holy quiet there, Or make the waters fret and sigh, Or the golden alders shiver, That bend to kiss the placid river, Flowing on and on for ever. But the little waves seem sleeping, O'er oh, the pebbles slowly creeping, That last night were flashing, leaping, Driven by the restless breeze, In lines of foam beneath yon trees. Dressed in robes of gorgeous hue, Brown and gold, with crimson blent, The forest to the water's blue Its own enchanting tints has lent. In their dark depths, lifelike glowing, we see a second forest growing, Each pictured leaf and branch bestowing A fairy grace on that twin wood, Mirrored within the crystal flood. Tis pleasant now, in forest shades, The Indian hunter strings his bow, To track, through dark, entangled glades, The antlered deer and bounding doe, Or launch at night his birch canoe, to spear the finny tribes that dwell On sandy bank, in weedy cell, Or pool the fisher knows right well, Seen by the red and livid glow Of pine-torch at his vessel's bow. This dreamy Indian summer day Attunes the soul to tender sadness. We love, but joy not in the ray, It is not summer's fervid gladness, But a melancholy glory, Hovering brightly round decay, Like swan that sings her own sad story, Ere she floats in death away. The day declines, What splendid dyes, In flickered waves of crimson driven, Float o'er the saffron sea, That lies glowing within the western heaven. Ah, it is a peerless even! See, the broad red sun has set, but his rays are quivering yet, Through nature's veil of violet, Streaming bright o'er lake and hill, But earth and forest lie so still, We start, and check the rising tear, Tis beauty sleeping on her bier. End of Introduction <laughs>